We are in the middle of a series called With Us. Isaac referenced it earlier. With you, not just with you, with us. This idea of community. God is with us. It's the word Emmanuel, with us. And we're in John chapter one today. If you have a Bible, you can turn to John one. There's Bibles provided in the back. You can pull it up on your device or the text will be on the screen. I was thinking about this message and the, the idea that God wanted to convey something to us. God wanted to send us a message. And there was written word, which they've had. People have had God's written word. You and I are fortunate enough to have a copy of God's written word in our own language. There are many parts of the world that do not have that luxury. And so we have a copy of God's word here today. When when you want to send a message to someone, we probably all would answer this question differently. As many people are in the room, there's probably as many different answers. What's the best way to communicate with you? For some of us, it's a phone call. Uh, some of us, snail mail. For those under 30, that's, there's a, a truck that drives up to a little box, and they put a physical paper, and there's a stamp in the top right corner. It's a letter. Some of us, it's a, shoot me a text. Some of us, it's DM, right? Slide into my DMs with Twitter, or it's Instagram, or it's email, right? There's hundreds of different ways to communicate. Facebook Messenger, and sometimes the conversation goes, hey, did you get my message? No, didn't get your message. How many of you have had that conversation? Did you get my message? No, I didn't get your message. Well, where did you send it? Now, there's 30 different places, 40 different places that you can send a message. Now, I have to check each one of these to make sure I received your message. God wanted to send us a message, and God's word was the part of that message, but when he really wanted to get our attention, right? what, did, what did he do? John chapter one today, he sends us a letter. Now, each year that goes on, there are fewer and fewer Christmas cards that we receive. I think you know, 20 years ago when my wife and I were starting out as a family, we sent Christmas cards and we probably had dozens of cards that we would receive. Now we're down to like three. There's a few remnant still out there. And when it comes to a Christmas card, there's a couple pictures usually on the card, one of two pictures. If you have a Christmas card, my guess is, if I was a betting man, it's one of these two things. Either it's a nativity scene, live nativity scene, right? Manger and a camel and some Don wise men maybe are there, even though they're not really part of it. Or it's your family photo. Somewhere during the year, you took a picture as a family and that made your Christmas card. One of those two. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that's what they go with when they tell the Christmas story. They tell a family story, a genealogy is Matthew chapter one. They tell the genealogy. Jesus' family, here's the family portrait. Mark and Luke, they go into the whole Christmas Eve, what's Mary and Joseph are doing, the shepherds and the wise men, right? John takes a different approach. John is written much later. By the time John is writing, there's a good chance many of the people already have little nativity sets in their family rooms, okay? So he doesn't feel the need to explain the shepherds and the sheep and the Mary and Joseph. He takes a different approach. John chapter one. In the beginning, John starts with in the beginning. For any of us who have maybe have read the Bible or you're familiar with another verse that begins that very same way, Genesis chapter one, verse one, in the beginning. John brings them back to the beginning. When's the beginning? It's not now. It's the very, very beginning. Was there a beginning? No, there wasn't ever really a beginning, but it's the beginning. John's going to try to talk to us about the beginning. It's not Christmas Eve. He goes to the very, very, very beginning because for us to really understand Christmas, we have to understand the beginning. In the beginning was the, and it should be capitalized in your Bible, the word, 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 and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, who is he and who is the word? Jesus Christ is who John is talking about this morning. High and lifted up. We sang each song was about Jesus today. Boulder Mountain Community Church, if you want to know a little bit about what was Boulder about and who are they, and we're about Jesus. 
Everything's about Jesus. We sing about Jesus. When we meet in groups, it's about Jesus. When we hear sermons, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. When we do events out here in the desert, it's about Jesus. We're about Jesus at Boulder Mountain. And who is John talking about in John 1, first few verses here? Jesus. All things were made through him. Everything was made through Jesus. This little baby in the manger, he lies. He looks up and in the sky, those stars in the sky above his manger, he placed them there. Every star was flung in the sky was named. Every star was named. And this very star above his manger was placed there by Jesus. Imagine that. That the star that the wise men followed from Asia, maybe from India, they came, they followed a star that was placed there by the baby who was in the manger. He placed that star above his manger. The manger that he laid in was planted, created, gave life to by Jesus so that one day it would be chopped down and the wood would be used for his manger in which he laid in. Everything, the entire material world was created in and through Jesus. The fact that there's gravity right now, the fact that the Solar system is in space right now. It's being held together, as Scripture says, through the power and the person of Jesus. Your breath, the next breath you take, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. If it was made, if we have it, if you've seen it, if it's been created, it's through Jesus. Everything, you and I, our very next breath, is a gift in and through the person of Jesus. We're not guaranteed our next breath. It's a gift. It's grace by Jesus. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The entire material world was made through Jesus, but also the entire spiritual world. The fact that any of us have spiritual life is because of Jesus. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, verse 9, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Imagine a picture, if you will. For all of eternity, from the very beginning, Jesus is inclined toward his Father. It's in perfect unity of the Trinity the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus has perfect community, perfect relationship with his heavenly Father. None of us have ever had perfect relationship with anyone, right? Why? Because it takes two people and both those people are sinners, right? There's a book on marriage called um, uh, When I Said I Do. What did you think was going to happen, <laughs> right? It's two sinners saying I do, what could go wrong, right? Of course, of course it's going to be difficult and challenging. Perfect relationship in heaven for eternity. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is inclined. He's leaning toward his Father, eye to eye. The perfect unity. That's what's happening. We looked at that passage last week in Hebrews. Before he steps out. He steps out from heaven and he steps to earth. So he turns his back on his father to leave heaven, to come to earth. And as he received, scripture tells us, those whom he created turned their backs on him. He leaves his father to come to earth and people did not receive him, rejected, rejected him. He came to his own, his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, who gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, not of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Everything that Jesus had in heaven, he says, I will leave this perfect relationship. I will leave perfect unity. I will leave perfect community, and I will come to earth. And those who believe in me, I will give them everything that I had in heaven, I will give to them. Everything Jesus had and has with his Father is given to those of us who've placed our faith and trust in him. I can't comprehend that. That is overwhelming to me, that Jesus would, would give that up to come to earth. And the word, verse 14, 
If anybody asks you, what's Christmas about? You can answer the question in four words. The word became flesh. That's a Christmas story right there. You don't need shepherds and camels in the manger and Mary and Joseph. Four words. The word became flesh. The word. Who's the word? Logos. Really powerful word, both to the Gentile and to the Jew. To the Gentile, the word logos in the philosophical world was this universal force. It was everything. It was like for Star Wars fans here, it was the force. May the force be with you. To a Gentile, philosophical Gentile, there was this force that created the universe. They didn't have a name for it other than logos, but it was abstract and it was impersonal. To the Jew, the Jew knew logos because the Jew had memorized scripture. And to the Jew, Every time in the Old Testament, this word would come up, the word of the Lord. Thus saith the word of the Lord. We have read it in our Bibles. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Jesus answers, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Matthew 24, heaven and earth shall pass away, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates, dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And who is the word? The word is Jesus. He is the word of the Lord. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17. Psalm, book of Psalm, chapter 38 says, my name is the word of the Lord. It's my name. The word of the Lord, you're asking as you read through John chapter one here, who is the word? The word is Jesus. And God says to his son, hey, they've had prophets, but they didn't have the prophet. They've had priests. They didn't have the priest. They've had judges. They didn't have the judge. They have had kings. None of that has worked out. They have not had the king. They have not had the one, God in the flesh, God in a bod, if that helps you remember. The word made flesh, Jesus, that is Christmas. The word made flesh, Jesus coming to earth. We have heard the word uh, sin. We talk about sin. Let's define sin for a, a moment. Sin is missing the mark. When I sin, I miss the mark. Uh, we all sin, and you will sin again, right? Scripture is really clear on that. We're, we're fallen people. What does it mean to make the mark? What does it mean to hit the mark? There's a Hebrew word called kavanah. Kavanah simply means when I study the word of God, it's a rabbinical word. When I study the word of God, I am hitting the mark. When I do it, not so I can look smarter, not so I can teach to you, not so I can be self-righteous and tell everybody, yeah, I studied God's word, but when I do it to get to know who God is, when I do it out of a love relationship with who God is, I study God's word, I'm hitting the mark. The best way to study God's word is in community. What would it look like in 2024 for you to have an intentional, systematic plan to read through God's word? If you haven't done that, let me challenge you to do that, to have a plan, regardless of the time of year, to have a plan to go through a book of the Bible. It's really important. You understand the word of God because what is happening when I hit the mark, what is happening is as I read this text, Jesus is with me. The word of God is Jesus. Who is the word? Jesus. And every jot and tittle, it says in scripture, I believe speaks to Jesus. Every verse talks about Jesus, whispers his name. Every chapter of your Bible points to Jesus, either points forward or points back to the person and the work of Jesus. What would it look like if you and I had a plan to read through God's word? Not as a checklist, but to really know and love God. When you read through that, you're hitting the mark because Jesus is sitting there. He's with you and he's with, with us. There's a process in scripture. 
for some of us, there, there are moments in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, that are come and see events. Live nativity is a come and see event. It's where Jesus is out on the hillside teaching and people hear about him. They're like, hey, let's go check this guy out. We've heard something. There's some stuff going on. Let's go, right? That's a come and see. Some of us are there. If we were to be honest, we're like, I'm just checking out the claims of Christ right now. The next step is to cross the line of faith, and that's follow me. Come and see, follow me. Jesus gives a, a call, a, follow me. Step three, if you're taking notes, right? be with me. Jesus asks us not just to follow him behind him, but be with him. Every, everywhere you go this week, you go to work, you go wherever you go, running Christmas errands, and you got grumpy people everywhere. Jesus is with you. For many of us, we're the grumpy ones. <laughs> be mindful the word of God made flesh. Jesus is present. He's with us. And then the last one is abide in Jesus, right? Be with Jesus. You're reading devotionals about Jesus. Abide in Jesus to take that next step is to be in his word. And he is becoming present as you read his word. Listen, Jesus is here. He is here right now. He is present in this place. You cannot avoid the presence of Jesus, friends. Whatever you need, he is. And as many people are in this room, there's many different needs. We all are needy people. And when Jesus came, a weary world rejoiced because God became man. But it was difficult. We rejoice, but what was happening in the relationship between the Father and the Son? Contemplate that. Contemplate that perspective. As Jesus is on earth, he is separated from his Father. Parents, have you ever been separated from your children, either physically, emotionally, spiritually? Prodigal children? Have you ever been a prodigal? Or have you ever had, parents, have you ever had a prodigal? God can relate. God was separated from his son for a season. They had perfect unity, perfect community, perfect relationship. It's the only perfect parent relationship that's ever been, right? And he stepped away from that. And I wonder when he told the story of the prodigal son, when Jesus shared that story in Luke chapter 15, I wonder if there was some emotion as he told that story. I wonder if his voice cracked a little bit. Because as he's telling that story, he's thinking of his own relationship with his father. And he's separated from his father. That one day he wants to be back with his father, but it's not today. He knows what it's like to be separated. Some of us are separated from our children, spiritually, emotionally. It's painful. It's heartbreaking. You want to go back to how it was. Wonder if Jesus had that same thought. But you were worth it. You were worth it. For some of us in our families, we're sharing Christmas lists right now. We're sharing about, hey, what we want. Stop to think about what does Jesus want? Let me tell you what he wants because it's all through scripture. The greatest gift that Jesus could ever get is you. The reason he left his throne in heaven was, was for you. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. That's how much, that's how much he, he loves you. Most powerful and comprehensible thought in all of scriptures, the word became flesh. He is the son of God. If we don't understand that, then we're gonna struggle the rest of the book of John. If, if we don't start with John understanding that he is the eternal, preexistent, always have been, he is no less God than his father, he is fully God, and, and fully man, then we're gonna have struggle as we go through the book of John when he's feeding 5,000, when he's turning water into wine in, in John chapter two. We're gonna struggle with every other story after this if we don't first understand that he is God, that Jesus is God. The word became flesh. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. His word called all, everything into being. I wanna propose to you that wherever you are at today, 
as you as you're here today. Some some reason you're here today. It's not a surprise to God that you're here in this room today. It's not a surprise that you were invited, that God placed you next door to that neighbor or you ran into that person who invited you here today or uh, for many people I interacted with last night, I simply said, hey, I'm here to pray for you and long line of people sharing problems and hurts and challenges. I'm so grateful they felt comfortable sharing that. But the same is true for us. Just because some of us have placed our faith in Jesus doesn't mean every, all our problems are solved, right? No matter what you need today, Jesus can meet that. And if you disagree with me, let me just propose to you what this looks like in Scripture. In the book of Genesis, Jesus is the ram at Abraham's altar. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. And in Numbers, he's the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the city of our refuge. In Joshua, he's the scarlet thread out Rahab's window. In Judges, he is our judge. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In, first in, in Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he's our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of everything that is broken. In Esther, he's Mordecai sitting faithfully at the gate. In Nahum, he's our avenger. I'm just trying to do this without looking. In Job, he's our redeemer that ever liveth. In Psalms, he is my shepherd and I shall not want. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is our wisdom. In Song of Solomon, he's our beautiful bridegroom. In Lamentations and Jeremiah, he is the weeping prophet. In Isaiah, he's the suffering servant. In Ezekiel, he's the wonderful four-faced man. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the midst of a fiery furnace. In Hosea, he is my love who is ever faithful. In Joel, he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he is our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he is our savior. In Jonah, he's the great foreign missionary that takes the word of God to India. In Micah, he's the messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, he is our avenger. In Habakkuk, he's the watchman who's ever praying for revival. In Zephaniah, he is our savior. In Haggai, he is the restorer of our lost heritage. In Zechariah, he is our fountain. And in Malachi, he is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. What do you need from Jesus today? He is it. Your deepest, greatest longing. He will meet you. In Matthew, he writes, thou art the Christ, the son of the most high. In Mark, he's the miracle worker. In Luke, he's the son of man. And in John, he's the door by which every one of us must enter. In Acts, he's the shining light that appears to Saul on the road to Damascus. In Romans, he's our justifier. In 1 Corinthians, he's our sin bearer. In 2 Corinthians, he's our resurrection. In Galatians, he redeems us from the law. In Ephesians, listen, he is our unsearchable riches. In Philippians, he supplies our every need. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In 1 and 2 Thessalonians, he is our soon coming king. In Titus, he's our blessed hope. In Philemon, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In 1 and 2 Timothy, he is the mediator between God and man. In 1 and 2 Peter, he's the chief shepherd. In 1, 2, and 3 John, it is Jesus who has the tenderness of love. In Jude, he is the Lord coming with 10,000 saints. In church, lift up your eyes for your redemption and my redemption draws nigh. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I don't know what you need today from Jesus, your deepest longing desires. He can meet you. For many of us, it's more than anything we could think of. Jesus is not in the manger anymore and he's not on the cross. He is here with us in the room today. Have you accepted him? Have you said yes to him? Because his Christmas gift is you. He desires to be with you. Have you received him as you would receive a gift? 
Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you that you wanted to send a message to us. You didn't shoot an email. You didn't send a text. It wasn't through technology. But you showed up in person. When we needed it the most, you showed up. That's how much you love us. It's an incomprehensible love. It's a love that makes no sense. And this morning, we're overwhelmed that you, Jesus, you are what we need today. And I pray as we reflect on this, as we reflect on the word that we have, Hebrews tells us that in long ago you spoke in many different ways through prophets and through judges and but today you speak through your son, Jesus. And we are fortunate enough to have your word and the person and the work of Jesus. And as we reflect on that, Father, if there's new life that must be created here this morning, spiritual life, I pray that you would draw us to yourself, that you would do, you would do a miracle in this room this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.